Hello everyone Just Broadcast TV is here please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified on new contents. Episode 179, Misunderstanding. After entering the office, James realized that Elliot was still standing outside. He turned around and shouted, You can come in. When he heard James's shout, Elliot's body shook. It was as if he had just come back to life. He really could not understand. What kind of person was James? How could he be so powerful? He actually knew a killer who had a grenade in his right hand and a gun in his left. More than that, the killer had been respectful to him. Was James also a killer? Uh, okay. However, it was clear that this was not the time to think about this question. Nodding, he quickly walked into the office. The moment he walked in, he saw Paul, who had been tied up and thrown on the floor. That was a terrible sight. It made Elliot's hair stand on end. Paul's mouth was sealed with a piece of duct tape, and he could not make any sound. However, when he saw Elliot, someone he knew, his eyes lit up with hope. He kept making muffled sounds, obviously begging Elliot for help. However, he could only struggle to move. Before Elliot could say anything, Dax Freeman gave Paul a kick. Shut up, or I'll rearrange your face, he said with a cold expression. His voice was as unpleasant as bones rubbing together and it conveyed an indescribable coldness. When Elliot and Paul heard it, their bodies trembled. They did not even breathe. James had taken a seat in the office chair. Freeman respectfully lit a cigarette for him, and he asked, So what's the story? Freeman nodded. He was as respectful as a servant. Master, this is what happened. Someone hired me to find this guy and make him refuse to accept a shipment of goods. A shipment of goods? Is it from a business in New York? When Dax Freeman heard that, he raised his brows. Then he pointed at Paul and said to James, Yes, yes, sir. That's what my employer said. He doesn't want me to kill him. He just wants this guy to refuse to accept any goods from this New York company. How did you know? Because the delivery you made him refuse to accept is from my good friend, Mr. Klein. Oh, I see, Lord Hades. I was blind. I'll walk away from this and let the deal proceed. But James waved his hand to stop Dax Freeman's words. There's no hurry, he said. After thinking for a moment, he said to Freeman, Go back and tell your employer not to mess with my friends again. I'm willing to let this go, but next time I won't be so lenient. Freeman could tell that James was really angry. He said, Master, don't trouble yourself. I'll take care of everything. After Freeman finished speaking, he bowed his head and left the office. Elliot was confused, but James understood the matter was settled. Once Freeman had left, James looked at Paul, who was still tied up on the ground. He walked over and said, Just nod or shake your head. Do you understand? Paul nodded. You refused to accept the goods. Did you have this intention in the first place? Paul shook his head desperately. So it wasn't your idea? Paul shook his head again. This man forced you to do it. Paul nodded urgently. All right, I'll rip off the tape. Don't shout, or else, James said. As soon as the tape was torn off, Paul said to Elliot, who was still in a daze, Thank you, sir, and your friend. Thank you so much. Listen, I was kidnapped by that guy early this morning. He forced me to make the call. I didn't want to do it. I don't know who sent him. You have to believe me. Seeing Paul's sincere face, Elliot said, All right, I believe you this time, but if there is a next time, I'm afraid. God, I hope not, said Paul. Elliot paused, then turned to James and said, Let's set him free. Okay. When James heard that, he snapped the ropes around Paul's hands and feet. Paul struggled to get up from the ground. He looked very embarrassed, but he quickly thanked James and Elliot. However, at this moment, there was a hurried knock on the door, and then they heard a man's voice. We are from the police department. We just received a report of a break-in, so we're checking all the rooms in the building. Paul was about to say that he was fine, but before he could, the man outside broke down the door. A security guard with a face full of bruises saw Elliot and James. He pointed and said, Yes, yes, 
It was these two guys, officers. They are two extremely dangerous people. Freeze! The two men in police uniforms instantly pulled out their guns. James and Elliot remained calm and collected, but Paul was angry. He walked over and slapped the security guard's face. He quickly said to the policemen, Officers, it's a misunderstanding. These are not dangerous people. They saved me just now. The two police officers were stunned. The security officer was also stunned. What was Paul talking about? The guard had bruises from his fight with James. Could it be that this executive was secretly being threatened by James and Elliot? He said, Don't be afraid, Mr. Paul. The police can protect you from these intruders. However, as soon as he finished speaking, Paul mercilessly slapped him again and then fiercely said to him, Shut up if you want to keep your job. These men saved me. Then he said to the policemen, Officers, it's really a misunderstanding. They saved me, and the person who really wanted to kill me has already left. Finally, he was able to convince them, and they left. The security guard did not understand what was going on until the end. But Paul didn't need him to understand. He just rolled his eyes and sent him away. This guy had almost ruined his plans. He said, Mr. Klein, would you introduce me to your friend? Elliot said proudly, This is James Tucker, my brother from another mother. It's an honor to meet you, Mr. Tucker. It's almost lunchtime. I wonder if you would both be so kind as to let me invite you to lunch? James waved his hand and said to Paul, No need. You don't need to thank me. Just go through with your business deal. Of course. Seeing that Paul was sincere, James said to Elliot, Let's go, buddy. Elliot nodded reflexively, then he looked at James in surprise. What? Just like that? Yeah, don't worry. It won't be a problem. I believe Paul is very sincere. There won't be any trouble from now on, James said confidently. Ah, yes, that's right. Don't worry, Mr. Klein. There's no way something like this will ever happen again. Okay, your word's good enough for me, said Elliot. Then he walked out of the office with James and headed downstairs. When they passed by the company's main entrance, a group of security guards cringed. Some were treating their wounds. Seeing the nervous expressions on their faces, James couldn't help but tease them a little. Don't be nervous. I'm not in the mood to play with you. The guards weren't reassured. They heaved a sigh of relief when James and Elliot walked out of the building and got into a taxi. In the taxi, James called the three beauties and asked them to rush to the Paris airport from the Verrerie Garden. It was time to bring Elliot to Chateau Remy to broaden his horizons. Outside the airport, the three beauties were already waiting. Edie was also there. Five of them had booked a flight to Bordeaux, but Edie was going back to New York. She had become popular at Paris Fashion Week and had won a lot of endorsements. Therefore, she was a hot commodity back home as well. She did not have the time to go to Bordeaux with Elliot to see this world-class winery. She had too much business to conduct back home. Her flight wasn't for a couple of hours, so she saw James and the others to their gate. He joked. My niece, when I return to New York, I'm afraid you will already be a famous person. You'll have to take me out to dinner. Edie smiled. Of course I will, Uncle James. My current achievements are all thanks to you. If it wasn't for you, where would I be now? Edie was very calm now. She did not mind James calling himself her uncle. After all, James and Elliot were like brothers, and she called Elliot Uncle Elliot, so why not? The three beauties hugged her one by one. She was like a sister to them now. James and his group arrived in Bordeaux not long after. The manager of Chateau Remy, Bernard, had been very happy when he found out that James was coming back to the winery. He was there to meet them in a limousine. As soon as James and his group left the airport, Bernard waved to them. He had a kind smile on his face that never changed. That kind of friendliness made Elliot, who was here for the first time, instantly warm to this honest old man. In the spacious car, Elliot smiled at James and said, Man, you are really lucky. An employee like Bernard is a treasure. He makes a person feel at home. James smiled and said, Yes, indeed, I think so too. Bernard was also very enthusiastic. He kept telling everyone about the scenery along the way. The Chateau Remy winery under the setting sun was exceptionally peaceful. It felt different from the first time James had come here. This time he felt a sense of familiarity for the property in his heart. Elliot's eyes were full of shock. 
because only now did he know that this famous winery was James's. This was truly unbelievable. Dinner was very scrumptious, and of course they enjoyed Remy 1982. The days at the winery allowed Elliot to enjoy a peace and comfort that he had never experienced before. However, he was an ambitious man. He was a mover and shaker in New York. He couldn't relax indefinitely. After staying for a few days, Elliot bid farewell to James and flew directly from Bordeaux to New York. James brought the three beauties back to the yacht and piloted it to England and the location of the next check-in, the gate of the University of Cambridge. Episode 180. You can try. Bordeaux was not far from London, and they set off directly across the English Channel, arriving in the UK in a few hours. After handling the relevant docking procedures, James steered the yacht directly to London along the River Thames. When they arrived, it was 10 o'clock at night. The entire city was enveloped in darkness. The bright lights of the city were exceptionally dazzling. Vanessa, Kristen, and Katie could not suppress the excitement in their hearts. Paris was called the romantic capital of the world, but in fact, London was also a very romantic and passionate city. This was once the cradle of the Industrial Revolution and had a long history of industrial development. But now it was also a sophisticated world capital. East Ocean Maritime had arranged everything and James successfully moored the yacht in London and plunged into the city with his lovely companions. There were plenty of beautiful women here. James couldn't help but notice them, though he tried to be discreet when he saw Vanessa rolling her eyes at him. He wondered if he should have come alone. Krista seemed to know London very well. First, she brought everyone to an international five-star hotel. After washing up and changing clothes, they were ready to head out again. On the advice of the staff at the front desk of the hotel, they went to a very famous restaurant in the city center to experience a sumptuous English dinner. After dinner, they went to the busiest place as usual to savor the local customs of the city and feel the warmth of the city. This was a bar called Edinburgh, one of the most famous in London and a very lively gathering place. They turned plenty of heads. James ordered a drink and watched the beautiful people dancing. They were all dressed very well. It was obvious that they were all upper-class people with good taste. James drank the expensive cocktail in his hand and leaned against the leather seat. From time to time, he would look at the gentlemen and ladies dancing in the middle of the dance floor, but he was feeling pretty bored. If not for the three beautiful women by his side, he probably would have invited someone to dance. However, at this moment, a handsome middle-aged man walked over and addressed Krista, who was besides James. Miss, would you care to dance with me? James felt a little angry. This guy had some nerve. Before Krista could answer, he said to the man, Back off. The man paid no attention to him. Only then did James notice that there was a striking scar on his forehead. The man smiled and said to Krista, You're a vision of loveliness. Could I persuade you to dance? James didn't care to be ignored. Are you deaf or something? I said back off. He spoke a little louder this time, which made all the guests around him look at him. This time, the fellow finally looked at James and said with a provocative look in his eyes, I was addressing the lady. Yeah, and I'm talking to you. She's here with me. She's not dancing with you. The strange man's polite expression darkened. He coldly smiled at James and said, And if I don't back off? Try it and see. Interesting. James's attitude immediately piqued the interest of the middle-aged man with the scar on his forehead. He ignored James and the curious gazes of the people around him. He raised his right hand and snapped his fingers. Then he looked at James with a faint smile. He didn't realize what he was getting himself into. About ten seconds later, a team of muscle-strapped thugs appeared from a side passage. Their leader, who was about 25 years old, rushed to the man with the scar on his forehead and asked respectfully, What's wrong, sir? The knife scar man grinned. He didn't even look at James as he said, This non-entity took offense at my inviting this beauty to dance. Viper, what do you think we should do? 
In his imagination, James had already begged him on bended knee to dance with Krista. The knife-scarred man enjoyed that kind of fantasy. He even laughed out loud. The bodyguard called Viper said, Leave it to me. This knife-scarred man was dressed like a gentleman, but he was a big name in the London underworld, known as Mad Dog. Over the years, he had squeezed into upper-class society, and he frequently appeared in high-end establishments like this. Viper looked at James and said fiercely, You clearly don't know who you're messing with. If the boss wants to dance with your woman, you better step aside. Then he waved his hand and said, Attack! Show this guy who's boss! You got it! When Viper's men heard this, they immediately obeyed. They surrounded James. However, before they could get close to him, James had already moved. He rushed out of the crowd. The slap landed heavily on Viper's face. You want to die? yelled Viper. However, before he could finish speaking, he was slapped by James again. You! Three slaps in a row shut Viper up. Everyone else in the bar was silent too. They all thought that James and his three girlfriends would definitely die today. The other bodyguards rushed James. One was almost seven feet tall. James only turned around and kicked him away. Then, while Viper was still in a daze, James slapped him again and sent him flying. He was quickly followed by all the other men. Only Mad Dog himself was left standing. The entire bar instantly became chaotic. Everyone else fled them in terror, but they didn't leave the room. They wanted to see what would happen. The battle ended in just 10 seconds and the surrounding spectators were besides themselves. I don't believe it. How can he be so strong? It's like he has divine power. As for Mad Dog, he seemed to have just realized what a terrifying man he had provoked. You, you... What was interesting was that the three women with James had been leisurely drinking and teasing him from the beginning. It was as if the fight had never happened. James cracked his neck and said, Your underlings are trash. I was hoping they put up a good fight, but I didn't even break a sweat. What about you? Mad Dog did not have the courage to fight James. He forced a laugh and said, Hey, it was just a misunderstanding. No hard feelings, right? Oh? James pointed at Krista and said provocatively, So you didn't really want to dance with her? Mad Dog was completely terrified. Let's just forget it, okay? In his eyes, James was like a devil. If he had known what he was doing, he wouldn't have dared to provoke him. But James grinned and said, You started this. Now dance with this beauty or fight me. Which will it be? Episode 181, Cuff Me Up. I was wrong, okay? I was wrong. Mad Dog's legs were weak and his whole body was shaking. He'd always hated multiple choice questions, but this one was the worst of all. He wanted to die. James was relentless. You have to choose one, otherwise I will choose for you. I was wrong. I apologize to you. He knew James was serious. Mad Dog fell to his knees and begged for mercy. The people around them all looked on with satisfaction. Mad Dog looked like a gentleman, but in reality, he was just a ruffian. He was a local tyrant who'd made everyone's life miserable. They all hated him, but they'd never been able to do anything about it. He was too powerful and had too many lackeys. Therefore, when they saw this guy being defeated by a foreigner, not only did the people around him not get angry, they burst into applause. In the end, Mad Dog could only say, Okay, I choose to dance with the lady. He figured that no matter what choice he made, he would die. However, he did not want to directly choose to fight James because that would simply be the same as getting beaten up. After all that, you still want to get your hands on my girl. James clenched his fist when he heard that. His knuckles popped with the sound of bones cracking. His fist poured down like raindrops. They hit Mad Dog until he found his teeth all over the ground and cried for his parents. In just a moment, Mad Dog's head was swollen from James's beating. James was smiling. Mad Dog raised his head and looked at James with tears streaming down his face. Why did you make me choose? James had clearly just been looking for an excuse to beat him up. The elite men and women standing around started clapping for James again. A man in his 50s walked up to James. He greeted him politely and said, 
You're really good. What's that fighting style called? James replied with a laugh. Just some silly tricks. You can't take them seriously. The man in his 50 smiled as well. His eyes were filled with respect. Tricks? You're really humble. Oh, my name is Edward King. I am the owner of this bar. Let's have a drink together. James said, you're very kind. It would be my pleasure. After all, he wasn't about to turn down a free drink. Wait a minute. Suddenly, a small group of policemen came into the room. Mr. King, someone reported a brawl. I'm here to investigate. No one leaves this bar. Oh, Officer Winterson, of course. I will definitely fully cooperate with your investigation, Edward King immediately said with a smile. At this moment, Mad Dog, who had been beaten up miserably, looked at Officer Winterson as if he had seen his savior. He crawled in front of him and shouted, Officer, save me. Just now, someone tried to kill me. You must save me. When Winterson saw Mad Dog, he was shocked. It was hard to believe that the local tyrant had been beaten so badly. Officer Winterson cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> Who was fighting here just now? It's him, officer. It's this lousy American, cried Mad Dog, pointing at James. Handcuff him, said Winterson, without asking any more questions. Everyone was speechless. It was like the police were taking orders from Mad Dog. Edward King frowned, but James smiled coldly. Yes, sir. The police officers behind Winterson immediately stepped forward and walked towards James. He saw clearly that they all had guns at their waist, but he was not nervous. He only looked at Mad Dog, who was standing next to Officer Winterson, and smiled again. That smile instantly sent chills down Mad Dog's spine. At this moment, although he felt that the initiative was in his hands, he did not have the courage to look at James again. James did not put up a fight. He didn't want to cause unnecessary trouble with the law in a foreign country. Wait. Edward King suddenly stepped forward and stopped the police officer who was about to handcuff James. Mr. King, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to stop us from enforcing the law? Asked Winterson. Edward King was not afraid of him and he immediately said in a loud voice, Officer Winterson, I respect the law, but I wonder if you could say the same. He had long disliked Winterson. He suspected he was on the take. You, began Winterson, but he was speechless. He felt guilty and he dared not say anything more. Please don't profane the law, Edward King said aggressively. Don't go too far. Officer Winterson clenched his fists and bared his teeth. He was furious. Too far? Did he say that I was going too far? King asked the crowd. You're the one who's gone too far. First of all, as a police officer who upholds justice after you came here, did you investigate the entire matter? Second of all, have you determined who is right and who is wrong in this whole incident? Lastly, you simply gave the order to handcuff someone. Do you know that he broke the law? Winterson was speechless again. His face was red as a beat. No to all three questions, right? said King. Since you don't even know what happened, why do you assume this man is in the wrong? Why do you want to handcuff him? These questions completely stumped Officer Winterson. Don't talk nonsense. I am the police officer. If I say that he's guilty, he is guilty. He pointed to King. Handcuff him too. Yes, sir. The policeman moved forward. James, who hadn't spoken a word, suddenly stretched out his hand and said, Hold on. He had been very cooperative. That was because the police had come for him alone. But it was different now. Because Edward King had been dragged into this, he had no choice but to take action. He couldn't let someone else get in trouble for standing up for him. He could play around in London and leave, but King's whole life was here. What's wrong with you? Officer Winterson asked impatiently. Officer, you guys are very particular about evidence, right? James asked. Of course. Officer Winterson raised his head proudly, looking like a judge. As long as the witnesses and the physical evidence are sufficient, we can confirm whether a person is wrong or not, right? Yes. That's good. James turned around immediately. Everyone, you all saw what happened here. Now I want to ask everyone to testify for me. As soon as he finished speaking, the bar fell silent. Seeing Officer Winterson looking at him with a cold smile, James smiled secretly in his heart. Then he said unhurriedly, If you testify for me, 
I will give you 10 million US dollars. Everyone started discussing this. The quiet bar instantly became noisy, restless. 10 million USD was a lot, but although they were very tempted, they thought it was too good to be true. King, who was besides James, spoke to him with a worried expression. Mr. Tucker, why are you being so reckless? That's a lot of money. After all, there were so many people here. Was James really going to give $10 million to each of them? However, he did not know that to James, who was a big shot with $100 billion to his name, hundreds of millions were like pocket change. It's okay. You stood up for me. That's worth more than a few million dollars. James said this very calmly, but King's eyes were sparkling with tears. He was really moved. Although James was rich, his words were true. Edward King's kindness and sense of justice had touched him first. But still, no one stood up to offer to be a witness. Krista, Katie, and Vanessa looked nervous. However, James still looked calm and confident. It was as if everything was under his control. He said confidently, My offer is limited to ten people. If I count to ten and no one is willing to testify for me, that's the end of it.